Welcome to Intersections and thank you for joining us for this broadcast. The music you're about to hear are the result of a collaborative project between the University of St Andrews Public Engagement with Research Team, the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland and the Laidlaw Music Centre. And the work has been supported by Explorathon, a Scotland-wide festival of research contributing to European Researchers' Night. Intersections itself paired eight PhD students from St Andrews researching across a variety of subject areas from the arts, humanities and sciences with eight composition students from the Conservatoire. Through conversations about their work, through sharing images and sounds and through developing a really deep understanding of each other's practice, the researchers and composers contributed to and wrote pieces of music that reflects parts of the research or the wide span of the research in question. The pieces also reflect a diversity of practice which demonstrate the creativity and the precision involved in both the research and in the composition. We very much hope you enjoy these thought-provoking pieces as much as our researchers and composers have enjoyed working together to create them. My name is Will Harkel, and I am interested in understanding glaciers and ice sheets, those fragile environments that have become the hallmark of climate change as we know it. In my research, I am looking to document how glaciers are changing using both ground-based and satellite instruments so that we can better appreciate the fragility of these complex systems. This is vital research because glaciers and ice sheets hold enough fresh water to raise sea levels by over 70 metres, which will destroy much of the world's coastline and low-lying islands. Right now, glaciers and ice sheets are the largest contributors to sea level rise, and do so through melting and by ice breaking away from its front through a process known as iceberg carving. I am trying to document these processes so that we can accurately predict how they will evolve in the future. Hello, my name is Aileen and I am a composer. I often explore different aspects of climate change within my music as I hope that it gives audiences a little bit of headspace to reflect upon the climate crisis, something that's often brushed aside in daily life. Will and I wanted to convey not only the significant importance of glaciers and the ice sheets in keeping our planet cool, but also the beauty of the glaciers and the surrounding landscapes, which Will has experienced firsthand. Will reached out to the glaciology community, and we were lucky enough to receive a vast array of field recordings and videos captured by scientists all over the world, so that I could get an insight visually and sonically. I had the pleasure of listening to a vast array of different field recordings captured by the scientists, and the piece takes influence from all of these recordings and tries to emulate the beautiful, raw and fragile aspects of these landscapes, as well as conveying a sense of isolation and harshness. The piece is called Siku and this is Greenlandic for sea ice.
Hello. I'm James and I research the commercialisation of typewriters in Scotland from the 1870s to the 1920s. I'm particularly interested in the way typewriters were advertised, sold and used. My project is a collaboration with the National Museum of Scotland, which, which has an absolutely fantastic collection of typewriters, which I study and I sometimes type on, at least when nobody at the museum is looking. At the time when I applied to be involved in this project, I had been thinking a lot about the relationship between music, rhythm and typing. From the late 1920s, typing teachers started using gramophone recordings in their classes. Whole classrooms of students would type along in unison to simple tunes, hitting the keys in a clear and consistent staccato style. An example of one of these recordings, produced by Isaac Pittman and Sons, is sampled to great effect in Darlene's composition. When I first met Darlene, I was pleased that she planned on producing a contemporary electronic piece of music for this project. For me, this reflected the relationship between the old and the new in the history of typewriters, the analogue and the digital. In the 21st century, typewriters are making a comeback. Yet, there is an irony in the fact that typewriters, machines originally built as cutting-edge technologies for writing speedily and efficiently, are the same technologies that people now use to disengage from the digital world. My discussions with Darlene encouraged me to look at my research from a whole new perspective. We laughed a lot about the slightly pretentious, hipster culture around typewriter collecting today. And as, a, as an owner of eight typewriters myself, I include myself in this category. For me, Darlene's composition is a playful piece of music, which encapsulates some of the humour and the irony in the way that we think about the history of typewriters. Hello, my name is Darlene. I'm the composer of this piece, the product of a collaborative project with James. I chose James' research about typewriters not just because I thought I could do a good job with creating a piece based off of it, but because in the application, James spoke about his passion for music. Although there were other applicants that made a note of their musical background, James was the only one I noticed who mentioned being directly inspired by the rhythm and music that is closely linked with the history of typewriting. I've never really considered myself a rhythmical composer. I've always felt more comfortable writing music that focuses on atmosphere and textures or just really glitchy aesthetics. So I thought this collaboration would be a good way to begin branching out of my comfort zone, even if it wasn't very far. Um, that being said, not only did I learn a lot about the history of typewriters and their social connotations, both in the past and present, but I also learned that James is a naturally gifted musician. Sure, he, um, he mentioned he played instruments, but playing instruments is a skill, at least in my opinion, and it wasn't until I met up with him in Edinburgh when he got his guitar to jam in the park um, did I realize he had a very mus that he had very musical feelings. And if I'm honest, it wasn't until then that I truly understood the intent behind the excerpt from Robert Bolt's book, The Typewriter Revolution, the excerpt being the typewriter manifesto from which this piece is based off of. Um, it wasn't until then that I finally understood uh, the impulse to rebel against the digital era. And perhaps these feelings were heightened from living in a pandemic-driven pandemic world where most of us now spend our days living behind a screen, swallowed up by the convenience that technology brings. I guess it was something about that moment that felt as simple as just sitting in a park, not knowing, just listening, and being intent on just being. And... I don't know why, but it just really stuck with me that day. And I wonder if James is aware <laughs> of the impact that day had on me. Um, it just really changed my mindset on the world for a moment. Um, 
I mean, I haven't told James, but maybe he'll find out now. So, yeah. Um, but all in all, it's been a pleasure working on this piece and getting to know James. So I hope you enjoy this piece. And I would also like to thank my friend Zakia Fawcett for putting together this video that you're also going to watch. Thank you. Begin. 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 We assert our right to resist the paradigm, to rebel against the information regime, to escape the date stream. We strike a blow for self-reliance, privacy, and coherence against dependency, dependency, surveillance, and disintegration. We affirm the written word and written thought against multimedia, multitasking, and the meme. We choose the real over representation, the physical over the digital, the durable over the unsustainable, the self-sufficient. The revolution will be typewritten. Between this and a, like the regular acoustic guitar. 
car. Um, where you could just plug this in. Oh, whoa, really? Yeah, so that's why that's why I got my flatmate to um, when he was in Edinburgh to get it because we were doing like a live thing, so he needed to be able to plug it in. Also, it comes with a tuner that's quite nice. Whoa! On the top, so that's quite useful. Um, because it's got a nine volt battery in it because it's like a I think it has to have a bit of like pre amplification before it goes into a normal speaker system you probably know more about that kind of no, thing than me but I don't yeah oh wow I mean because I don't if you were to just like I do I remember one time having an acoustic sound and I put a pick up on it and I went somewhere to play and it didn't work because you need like a preamp before it will go through the speaker yeah. but this is garlic like with the nine volt battery or whatever <laughs> um <laughs> I haven't really done. Hi, I'm Stuart, a PhD student in mathematics at the University of St Andrews. A few months ago, I heard about this opportunity to work with a composer and create a piece of music based on the topic of my research. I jumped at the opportunity to do this because I think it's really important for all the research that gets done behind closed doors to make it out into the world in some form and have an impact. And what better way to do that than through music? So the piece you're about to hear is inspired by fractal geometry. Uh, the topic I've been studying for the past three and a half years. But what is a fractal? Well, a fractal is a shape that has an infinite amount of detail at very small scales. Simply put, this means that it looks very fuzzy and complex. A popular example is a coastline. If you imagine looking at a coastline on a map, it's going to look like a very rough and jagged line. But if you were to stand on a cliff or a beach and look at the very same piece of coastline, it would still appear very jagged and complex, even though you're so much more zoomed in than from the vantage point of the map. Um, so it's an example of a fractal. The specific fractal that this piece of music was inspired by is called the Mandelbrot set. Uh, this is a fascinating uh, object that's named after one of the early pioneers of the field. What makes it particularly interesting is that while it is a fractal itself, Every point within the Mandelbrot set corresponds to another fractal called a Julia set. And in this sense, it can kind of be thought of as a fractal of fractals. Um, but I'm going to pass you over to Erin now, who can tell you a little bit more. Uh, but I really hope you enjoy the piece of music and are perhaps inspired to go and learn a little bit more about this topic. Hi, my name is Erin Thompson and I am a fourth year composer at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Like Stuart, I jumped at the opportunity to collaborate with a PhD researcher at the University of St Andrews because I think it's vital to explore and collaborate with people across different disciplines. Because music is a universal language, we can bring their vital research to a wider audience. And it's such important work that's being done. So through the collaboration process with Stuart, we explored fractals and what they mean around the world, how we see them in nature, and the more complex selections such as the Mandelbrot set. And that's what we decided to focus on for the piece of music. So I explore selected fractals and I explore how they develop and how they progress from one to another. So I look into how they build in depth and how they build in complexity at a surface level. So the piece Infinite Kaleidoscope is for flute and electronics and I would like to give a special thanks to Tilly Colton, a flute player at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland because she helped me record the flute parts for the electronics as well as helping me through the composition stages and bringing the piece to life. I really hope you enjoy this performance and I hope you can appreciate all the work that went into this. It was such an amazing experience and especially at such a time in the music industry to be able to collaborate and bring such a involved piece of work 
to an audience is something that I am so thankful for at this moment in time. So I really hope you enjoy it. I hope Stuart enjoys it too. Um, and thanks for listening.
Hello, I'm Jan, and this is Holger. We composed and collaborated on the piece, which is currently called Ubal's Dream, which I composed based on uh, Holger's medieval calendar research. Why did you pitch to be part of this project, and what is it that you actually pitched? Well, so my research is on medieval calendars, as Sian said. I have a background in music. Uh, I play the cello, and thinking about time it's always related to to hearing time in a medieval uh, soundscape um, you would have always heard indications of time in terms of, of hearing church bells for instance you wouldn't have seen time quite as much as you would have heard it time being an important component in, in music it always uh, tickled my imagination let's say or gave me these ideas of how some of what I work with could be integrated into music making. Because, yeah, it's funny, you could actually speak about medieval calendars and hearing time. Is that because that's something which I like to do in my own music, which is I like strictly structure things. And when I read your proposal, actually talking about hearing time in that way, it immediately struck me as something which is this is a really interesting and concrete structure for a piece of music. And that drew me in immediately. So that's how this collaboration got started. Yeah, so I mean, I could say um, uh, perhaps a couple of words about the the, the uh, medieval calendar and, and how it works and um, the structure of it. They would have been used uh, over decades or centuries. So uh, there were mechanisms in the medieval calendar that enabled one to use the same calendar year after year after year after year, even decade after decade. And, and sometimes we have evidence of the same manuscript have been, having been used um, over centuries. So uh, it's sort of communal long-term reference point in terms of things to commemorate, for instance, and, and, and phenomena to observe. As a result, we have these different layers uh, of information, different cycles of time represented there interacting and it makes for a, a quite a uh, layered uh, structure of the calendar. The other thing is that they use the Roman dating system and not the uh, one we use today. Now, the Roman system works a little bit differently. So you have three named days in the month, which are the calends, and then the knowns, and then the ides. Once you pass one of the name dates, you start counting down towards the, the, the next one. And um, I think Jan figured out a way to integrate that into his composition. I did, that's exactly where the main bass harmony of the, of the piece comes from. I chose a different harmony, so it shifts down the semitone when you get a different one of these name days. And I basically yeah. structured the piece in these three different harmonies. Yeah. Uh, by region my guitar loads yeah a lot of my research is to do with um with central italy so medieval gubbio is an uh, especially interesting point of reference for my research now in medieval gubbio there is one patron saint a saint uh, above uh, the rest uh, saint ubald we are fortunate to have from ubald's uh, liturgy a, a manuscript, uh, so that provided us with an interesting uh, link uh, between my research very specifically and then a musical composition. So my idea was that maybe this music could provide some some uh, elements into the composition. I ended up coming up with um, the idea to use the veil of the gamba the cello and the electric guitar as three different instruments for the piece. I have a friend called Israel Castillo who recorded the various parts of the Overbald music. Then I basically chopped them up and layered them and put them on top of each other to try and get this idea that he's playing the same thing three times, but it's not quite not quite the same the whole time. So you get this like just like not quite matching up of three different versions of the of the piece I've taken on the excerpts of it. And then I asked Holger, who's also a fantastic cellist, to do the same with the cello. And then with the guitar, I basically had loads of resonance and bell sounds and and harmonics. So that the, re the electric guitar kind of made the structure of the piece. It took a long time for the music to kind of come through the, and that 
was interesting to me. What's left for us to do? I mean, we're st still, we haven't done the video, which we are supposed to also provide for this, this music. And for that, I was thinking of, of using some scenes from uh, St. Dubal's life. Uh, from uh, these stained uh, glass windows of of Ubald's uh, church in in Gubbio, uh, I hope uh, we'll manage to integrate that into the uh, into the piece as well.
Hello, I'm Oli Hawker. I am a second year master's student at RCS and I wrote Loch Arbor No More in collaboration with Emily Betts, who's a, a PhD student at St. Andrews University, uh, researching the history of melancholy in Britain from 1580 to 1780. Uh, the piece was performed on violin by Rory Geddes. Um, and so when I was working with Emily, as with most things at the moment, it involved a lot of Zoom calls uh, where Emily was talking about her research. And I th the thing that kind of uh, really interested me was religious melancholy um, and this idea that was particularly prevalent in Protestant religions back then, uh, that unless you were a little bit sad, you weren't really Christian. Uh, and especially this idea of religious melancholic ecstasy where they would kind of work themselves up into such a state of melancholia that um, they kind of got this religious uh, ecstasy from from that experience um, and then so the real breakthrough came when Emily found a songbook in the archives uh, called The Merry Musician um, that was kind of billed as a, a cure for melancholy um, and what was quite weird about it I found was that most of these songs were really sad uh, and so uh, we ended up choosing one called uh, Farewell to Loch Arbor, which is an old Scottish traditional tune um, based on an Irish tune. Uh, and so what I did with that is that I wrote out the original tune and harmonized it a bit. And then I wrote it out again, but with a bit less there and then wrote that out again with a bit less there and wrote that out again with a bit less there. So there's this kind of gradual disintegration uh, of the violin part. And while the violin part is falling away, the electronic part is gradually building up um, and by sampling the violin uh, and letting these samples kind of drift in and out, sometimes sped up, sometimes slowed down. Um, and throughout the piece, there's this kind of increase in uh, reverb. Um, and by the end, there's this kind of big all-encompassing wash of, of reverb. Um, and, and reverb as a, as a sound is particularly tied up in religion uh, because churches were kind of one of the first places that were designed for these reverbs and that could uh, that would be were used to, um, for this kind of sound of reverb and where people could go and appreciate it. Um, so I thought that was quite a good way of kind of tying in the, the religious aspect uh, of the research. But I guess kind of in, in broader themes, what I was looking at was the kind of happy, sad binary and um, how it's kind of inadequate for describing anything to do with our lives and that sometimes... Um, sometimes feeling incredibly sad can feel incredibly good uh, and vice versa. And so to me, this piece is both incredibly sad, um, but also very comforting and kind of all encompassing. And by the end, you're kind of swimming in treacle, um, which I think is a kind of um, maybe a good representation of melancholia. Um, and I think that while these feelings are enticing, we obviously shouldn't be indulging them too much, uh, but it can't hurt to kind of explore them and, and acknowledge them at the least. Um, but it was a really fun project and I want to really thank Emily for all her help um, and kind of giving me a really, really interesting topic to, to write about. Um, and obviously I want to thank Rory for, for playing the piece beautifully uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily Betts, and I'm in the final year of my PhD at the University of St. Andrews. My research focuses on 17th and 18th century British medical history, and in particular, I work on mental illness and melancholy. Melancholy was a disease very similar to modern day depression. Um, its main symptoms were unsubstantiated fear and sadness, and it had a host of other physical symptoms attached to it as well, uh, things like chest pain, back pain, uh, heart palpitations, and difficulty breathing at times were all part of the symptoms that one could have when they were diagnosed with melancholy. I was really drawn to applying for this project because of the things that I found surrounding music in my research on melancholy. So music was considered one of the major cures for those who were diagnosed with this disease. Um, and so I thought that it would be a really great way to explore my research by creating this piece of music with Ollie. In 
it would be a medium other than the written word. That's something that I usually don't get to do. So when Ollie and I were deciding on the focus of this piece, we thought it would be great to look at the type of melancholy known as religious melancholy. So this type of melancholy affected those who felt extreme anxiety over religious issues whether they were worried about their sins or maybe they felt that their souls were damned, the sufferers of this type of melancholy usually attributed this disease as a sign of punishment from God, as a sign that they weren't leading their lives the way that God would want them to. So because of this, it became a common trope in tales of religious salvation, especially in the 17th century. A lot of spiritual autobiographies use melancholia to indicate how wretched the author was or how much he or she suffered before they were finally saved by the grace of God. And it was these opposing emotions of despair and elation that were paired in the experience of religious melancholy that were something that Ollie and I wanted to capture in this project. And at the same time, we wanted to bring in the element of music as a cure for melancholy that was endorsed by so many of the medical professionals in this era. So we ended up sourcing a song specifically recommended for curing sadness, and that song actually lent a part of its melody to our final product.
Hi, I'm Rylan Gleave. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a composer in the second year of my MLS degree at the RCS. I chose Sam Pearson's research to work with as he'd written, I really have no idea how you would use my research to make music. And that was really reassuring to read in the early stages as my collaboration with non-musicians or artists from non-performance disciplines has been really quite minimal. And I felt like working with someone on the same page would be a really good place to start. Sam's research also sounded far more complicated than anything I had ever studied, but he'd explained it succinctly in a way that I could understand, and I felt as though that we could establish a good level of communication from this. The meeting we had was so thought-provoking, and so unlike the usual meet your musicians chat, um, and it involved Sam explaining his research in accessible terms to me, why he was fascinated by brown dwarves which fall into the regions between stars and planets, um, and also some of the methods of research which I found really interesting. This conversation made me think of my friend Fraser, who studied astrophysics and had once explained this to me at a band rehearsal. Fraser, as a phenomenal guitarist and someone who could understand Sam's research, seemed like the perfect performer to have on board, uh, so I sent them a message and we worked from there. Fraser further explained some of the research to me and we discussed musical ideas and narrative structure to make a piece that was connected to the research but also quite idiomatic to their skills. The use of guitar tabs in addition to more standard and graphic notation um, was a useful learning curve for me because I've not worked with guitar tabs before and I felt made the piece more accessible and so any guitarist wanting to perform it in the future could pick it up. In terms of the score, I decided to use some of the graphs that Sam had sent me as a, a visual stimuli for generating material, left to the discretion of the performer and played over some ostinati. Um, Fraser and I toyed with several ideas of format, such as looping and then playing material over the top, um, but decided that um, having a pre-recorded guitar part with a live guitarist playing over um, was the most expressive way of communicating all of the musical ideas that best represented this narrative. The piece ended up being specific to Fraser's skills, but I feel as though any guitarist could create their own version based on the openness of the score. I think Sam's research made for some incredible musical ideas, and Fraser's playing really connected all of these elements beautifully, and I would like to thank both of them for their time and efforts into this piece. Hello, my name is Sam Pearson. I'm a th third year PhD student at the University of St Andrews, um, and I'm an astrophysicist or observational astronomer, and my research focuses on brown dwarfs. So brown dwarfs are these interesting objects that fall sort of into the middle ground in between stars and planets. So they're more massive than planets, but less massive than stars. And the key difference between a brown dwarf and a star is that a brown dwarf is not massive enough to sustain stable hydrogen fusion. So that is, there isn't enough mass or stuff squeezing together with gravity um, to make the, the core hot enough to have uh, hydrogen fusion. So a brown dwarf, in a sense, sort of won't shine the way that a, a star like our sun does. So the fact that it's not sort of shining means that optically it's a lot fainter, a lot dimmer, a lot harder to sort of see with telescopes. And this presents sort of a range of challenges um, when we're trying to observe them, but there's still plenty of things we can sort of, we can do to get around that. Um, and there's, there's loads of these things, there's loads of brown dwarfs, and so sort of studying and working out where they come from, how they're evolving, that's uh, very interesting, that's sort of what I get to do. Um, so yeah, during this process, this process has been very unique and quite sort of exciting because of that. Like when I was yeah, signing up to do an astrophysics PhD, at no point do I expect to be working with uh, a composer. Um, so just having having an opportunity to look at that completely different side of things from a different angle um, is, yeah, really, really interesting to do. So like talking to Rylan and specifically sort of talking to him about my research and finding the bits that uh, sort of strike a chord with him that he can work with that are, that are useful uh, that was that was a very interesting process and um, also yeah I want to thank Ryland for all, all his hard work on that it's been really interesting watching um, watching what he's come up with like there's there are like the graphs and stuff that I've looked at hundreds of times and have plans to lots of things that I could do with those graphs but at no point do I look at them and see 
um, ways is you ways you can sort of manipulate musical phrasing out of that. And that's not something I'd have seen. So having a look from that other perspective was uh, really interesting. So yeah, I'd like to thank thanks to Ryan Ryan for that, and also thanks to Fraser. Uh, they're clearly a very talented musician. Um, so thank you for their hard work on that. Uh, and yeah, thank you for this opportunity. It's been really fun, uh, an interesting experience. <laughs>
Hi, my name is Siobhan and I'm a composer and I'm working with Laura who's doing her PhD in English right now. Um, she has created a lot of st short stories which are all very, very good in their own right but there was one that stuck out to me the most called uh, A Warm Good Feeling. And the reason the piece is called The Knife is because the first sentence, shall I say, um, is just the knife and it instantly grabbed my attention. Upon reading the story, I, I found it quite a psychological horror and kind of all that kind of psychological damage and schizophrenia and just paranoia all together. So I, I felt like I could have a lot of fun with this piece. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, there's a little bit of a PSA because there is depictions of blood and it can be a bit unsettling. So if you're if you feel that you can, if you cannot handle that, then I will not be offended. If you do not want to watch it, that's absolutely fine. Okay, thank you. Bye. Hi, my name is Laura Mutzelfeld and I'm in my second year of a PhD in creative writing at the University of St Andrews. My collaboration with Siobhan started um, with a discussion and then I sent her some examples of my research as well as a few of the short stories that I've written. She read these and picked a short story called A Warm Good Feeling to use as inspiration for her song. Um, this is also my favourite story that I've written so far. My research is primarily into memory from a cognitive psychology point of view. Specifically, I've been looking at involuntary memories, which is when a memory pops into your head um, without you deliberately trying to recall it. So, for example, if I wrote the word mint on a shopping list, it might remind me of a time when I was picking fresh mint in my grandfather's garden. I've been using this research to analyse the work of Ali Smith. Um, particularly, I've been looking at um, one of her novels called Autumn. My writing has very much been influenced by my research and I'm working on a collection of short stories um, based on the theme of memory. A Warm Good Feeling is one of these stories. In this story, a homeless man experiences a series of involuntary memories from happy and sad events in his past. And these memories are particularly vivid for him. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I really hope you enjoy the song. And I just wanted to say that I've really, really enjoyed participating in this um, collaboration. And um, I love how Siobhan has taken one of my dark short stories and made it into an even darker song, which I love. OK, thank you. Bye. Just an idealized version of the place we left years ago. Right. Good. Safe. Color. She might have a radio. Stand still. He can tune into the mad chatter of the birds. The knife. Homeless. Peculiar music of the wind, like fingers through the branches of the trees. He scans the street. The rooms painted dark colours, blue, green, and grey. He'd found a tool. Hard, sharp, no longer part of him. The blue IKEA bag. The knife. Homeless. Miss Bloom's classroom, meeting new foster parents. The water runs pink off his fingers. He holds his fingers out. His hands look older. Is he 26 or 27? He has to say so. He looks over one shoulder, then the other. An ancient voice, a familiar voice in his head says, She's not coming back. He tidies his bags. He counts them. The blue one. Five. There were five. He smiles. 
the best clothes to watch over them. This street, there are Christmas trees. The lights on the trees cycle through different flashing patterns, and he watches until he can predict what pattern will be next. Christmas. His mum always got him clothes. Santa get him through the baddest for you? But he can't control it. Or maybe, just maybe, he lifted them. Like bad or like sun. Connecting with dad and his felt good. Dad and isn't talking anymore. Yeah. Yeah. He packs his bags again. Blue Ikea bag. Five. The lady is walking. The radio. Can you look for it? Sam taps his foot. Eating out a manic rhythm. We know the placement's broken down, Sam. Wanna tell me why? A siren. An ambulance. The memory fades, but the room is still there in his mind. She'd ruined it all. <laughs> Sound startles him. He wheels around a car door. Sound reaches into his pocket, touches the cold handle. He feels his heart beat slow. People leave things for you. You have to keep your wits about you. You never know who left it or why. Felt the company of a familiar stranger at times like this. The stranger, tall, short, like his younger self, walked a few steps behind him, following him in the shadows. It was strange that someone following him could lead him somewhere. Another ambulance fled along the main road. The sound is terror and every cell in his body flinches. He tries to stop the memory of meeting this room that day. It didn't even really remember me at all. <laughs> Steps out without looking. Hands in. It's easier to avoid mirrors. They count his bags, starting with the blue IKEA one again. One, two, three, four, five. There are five. He will you. Aye, that would help it. He could listen to it when he was alone on his own. Drown out all the other voices of it. I'm really sorry. But it doesn't take normal batteries. You need to order a special one and they're like £16. Pounds. Could you not just order it and I'll be here tomorrow? Uh, no, sorry. Anyways, my son's a bit cross. Uh, it's technically his, so... <laughs> I was really looking forward to it. And... He, he, he doesn't think, he just... He feels it. Feeling feeling of having been tricked. It has been. The woman with the child is still standing there. And the hand goes into his coat pocket and brings it out. It doesn't feel like his hand. None of them are. Stepping forward and has the knife up. He thinks of Miss Bloom. And then drops to his hands and leaves. She's praying, dark red pulling around her. Someone's coming, cyclist. Walk away and don't look back. And Sam turns and starts to walk down the street. There is no noise, no bird sound, just the sound of blood pumping in his ears. My name is Sonia Kilman, I'm a sound artist, composer and producer and I created the sound behind Mineral Snowflakes with the help of Dominic who studies exoplanets and their cloud formations. Um, I was able to create an auditory tour uh, of such a planet 
I didn't know much about this beforehand and this is sort of my interpretation of Dominic's research um, which he has had a lot of input in as well and he's given me a lot of feedback on whether my interpretation is accurate or not but um, based on his description of what one might hear on such a planet uh, I used a lot of dry sounds, I used volcanic ash that I'd collected in Iceland along with wind sounds that I'd also collected in Iceland um, and a lot of other synthesizer sounds and ambient noise uh, which may be representative of one, what one might hear on an exoplanet um, or the type that he studies. You will hear more about this in his video. Um, I hope you enjoy and I hope this gives you a sense of the sound um, that Dominic's research incorporates. I'm Dominic Samra, a PhD student in astrophysics at the University of St Andrews, and I study the formation of clouds on gas giant exoplanets. So an exoplanet is just a planet orbiting around a star other than our sun, and one type of exoplanet that I study in particular are called ultra-hot Jupiters, which, as the name suggests, are planets similar in size and mass to Jupiter, but these planets orbit much closer to their star than Jupiter does to our sun, and are therefore much hotter. Also, because of how close they are to the star, they are tidally locked, which means that one side of the planet always faces the star, and one side of the planet is always facing away, for the same reason that only one side of the moon ever faces Earth. And therefore, on the day side, which is the side facing the star, the temperatures can become incredibly high, above 2,500 degrees Celsius, while the night side remains cooler but is still quite hot at above 500 degrees Celsius. And what this means is that the clouds that form, and they mostly form on the night side of these planets, are unlike anything we see on Earth. They're made of minerals, the stuff that makes up quartz, rubies, diamonds and sapphires. And because these are solid cloud particles, they might form intricate and delicate shapes, like the snowflakes we see on Earth hence the term mineral snowflakes. But because we only see these clouds through the light they absorb and scatter, we don't really know a lot about them, and that's what I try to understand. I was really excited to work with Sonia on this project, and I think she's done an amazing job of capturing what it would be like to be an astronaut floating around one of these ultra-hot Jupiter's atmospheres. Because we only see these planets from their gravitational effects and from the shadows they cast in their star's light, we don't know what it would sound like in these atmospheres. And because the processes of these clouds forming are totally alien to the Earth, there aren't any equivalent sounds on Earth. But again, I think Sonia's done an amazing job of taking sounds from Earth to match the processes that would happen in an ultra Jupiter and to give a real sense of what it might be like to be floating in amongst these clouds. I am really happy with how the piece turned out, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 